This is All Things Considered. From NPR News, I'm Michelle Norris. And I'm Robert Siegel. I started singing, but I That's Don McLean's song, American Pie, and it figures prominently in our next story. A Michigan city is trying to put a positive spin on a negative story published by Newsweek earlier this year. As Michigan Radio's Lindsay Smith reports, the people of Grand Rapids have put together a remarkable music video set to American Pie, and it's getting rave reviews. Okay, so right about now you're thinking, he's supposed to be talking about design as activism. And what does this NPR clip have to do with that? Well, even Brian may not realize this, but radio is like public space. Okay, follow me on this for once, just a minute. I have no ties to Grand Rapids, Michigan, or the Midwest. And I hope I'm not offending anybody by saying that I'm not an aficionado of Don McLean or this song. And uh, economic development video, not exactly scintillating, right? But the rest of the story was incredibly well done and interesting. And I was intrigued enough to watch the video on YouTube, to look up Grand Rapids on Wikipedia, and to click through on links and find out that the city was rebranding itself as an arts community. And it had a nascent arts district and a thriving queer community. And I made a note to myself to keep track of were there any projects there that I could work on. And all of that is because <clears throat> Unlike a playlist, or an aggregator, or a recommending website, or a news feed or a blog feed, that was, this story was just one of 24, or two dozen or three dozen, on that day's All Things Considered. And I was listening and pulled in by a random story on a program that most of you know has, random vo has a diverse voices and stories and viewpoints. And that is the way public space works. It's a place where we can comfortably and safely interact with people that we don't know, and we cannot anticipate how we're going to interact with them. Richard Louvre and other writers in the last couple of years have been talking a lot about nature deficiency disorder and how our society is endangered by young people <clears throat> having little or no experience with green space. And I believe that our society is just in, as endangered if young people and all people have little experience and little interaction in public space. Very recently, a lot of scientists, including uh, Greg West on TED, have actually been talking about their research into the vibrancy of cities. And <clears throat> I think it's really important to bore down into the actual activities and components that they're talking about that make cities drivers of creativity and innovation and, and productivity. Activities like um, clusters of people, interaction, social networks, density, those are the things that actually happen in public space. Um, I really, in our society today, we deal with all of these overlapping and juxtaposed issues of fear and control and uh, privacy. And I really believe that pro public space is not just the thing that makes cities thrive, it's what makes us as humans thrive. It's what makes us more human. It makes us able to understand and willing to understand and live with other people. And that's why pub public space is where society is formed. We know that it takes a lot of people, a lot of players to create um, and change society politicians, um, media people, big business people, Supreme Court justices. <laughs> but I bring this up for a reason. We all get that our laws, our courts, our judges, our lawyers, they form the legal framework for our society. And the way we use those laws and change them and push against them help to change us and our society. Well, public space is the physical framework of our society. And the way we try, choose to view it and use it and design it will change our lives and our society. What is public space? We all know it's green spaces and landmarks like parks, plazas, 
memorials, playgrounds. But it's also sidewalks and streets and bike lanes, transportation lines and transportation hubs. And it's everything that connects us to, each one, to one another. It's everything that connects our communities, everything that connects our cities and makes those larger conglomerations vibrant public places in themselves. Take a moment with me. Close your eyes. Think about the path that you all took to get here today, the choices that you made, the place where the sidewalk was more crowded, where the crossing is, more, is safer, the, where you were shaded, where you were protected from the wind, which subway staircase was closer to Starbucks. Okay, all of that, all of that is public space, and all of that is public space design, for good or bad. <clears throat> and more importantly, all of those choices that every one of us make every day about how we use public space or don't use it or where we use it, it imprints us as individuals and as community members. Um, I'm also not saying, well, I think we also know that Community today happens in other ways. Um, it happens online. It happens in social networks. But I think the danger is for us to say, it, we'll let it happen only there. It has to be combined with face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, what does the um, hipster who creates the, uh, the creative online community do? He, creates a, he, he stages a, f a flash mob in a public place. What do the two people who meet online do? They meet in public place. And what do the dem democracy activists who have gathered tens of thousands of people to create change do? They call them out to the street to create social change. For all these reasons, public space design is activism. It is social, economic, and environmental justice. It is about making our cities and our communities more sustainable, more livable, healthier, more equitable. And it's a powerful tool for change. Think about in the battle on climate change, um, how we actually make, how in cities, people make choices to live in smaller homes and in smaller properties because they have good public parks and public spaces where they can play and do things. And people choose not to drive as long a distance in a huge car because the streets and other, other public places that take them to those public places are pleasant and interesting and bikeable and walkable. Um, when, I, um, when I was young, a long time ago, and wandered these very halls, and got in trouble for wandering these very halls. I was an idealist, and I was interested in design. But I didn't even, I had no idea that landscape architecture and urban planning were even professions. And so I thought I'd give you a couple of concrete examples, pun intended, of the kind of work I get to do as a landscape architect, urban planner, and activist. Um, in Oakland, California, I got to work with a working class neighborhood that had no parks, no safe routes to get to school or shops or transportation. And working with the transportation lines, we actually took these abandoned properties underneath commuter rail lines and turned them into multi-use uh, multi trails like this for biking and walking um, and recreation. In downtown San Francisco, I was able to work with the city and developers and property owners and community groups and residents to um, help envision how abandoned streets like this and abandoned storefronts could be turned into vibrant streetscapes like this, drawing people downtown and bringing residents downtown and, and pedestrians and shop owners and diners. In San Francisco's Castro District, I was proud to work with the queer community and to take this windswept, barren site, but 
something that's also a historic intersection and a, and a vital transportation hub and turn it into this, the community's very first public gathering space. I've also worked with cities like Seattle and um, Phoenix and, and Los Angeles on new rail lines and figuring out where they should go, how they'll affect the communities that already live there, and how to build public space around transportation. And I co-authored an action guide online to help communities uh, figure out how to bring more affordable housing around transportation. Right now, I'm actually working on a couple of projects I'm especially excited about. One is a public space strategic plan, and the idea he here is to help communities come up with a long-term plan that they can work out of. Where should public space go? How, what they can do to, to existing public space to make it more successful. In our current fiscal climate, the communities need this even more. The other is a changing communities um, strategic plan. And this is for communities going through flux. And the idea is that when a new rail line or a new development is built, how, what, how can the community identify what are the key anchors in the community that need to be preserved or strengthened in order to make that, enable that community to survive and be vibrant? And the last is I'm working on a book and uh, uh, web resources to help lay people understand how public space works and doesn't. Oops, did it again. Okay, so now that I've gotten you all excited about public space, right, and I'm, you're all willing to devote the rest of your lives to public space design as a, as a tool of social change, what's the next step? What's, what can you do? What's the call to arms? <laughs> I think there's a couple of things. One is that every single person, I believe that every single person in this room could be involved in public space design as an educated community member. And what does that mean? That means thinking about how, what public space means to you, what it means to your community, getting involved in public space design processes, getting involved in stewardship of pu public spaces. So that's one thing that everybody can do. But more importantly, the design profession, professions need you. And why? So if I believe that public space is so core to society, of course I'm going to believe that the best and brightest young people <laughs> need to get involved in the design professions. But I actually, uh, it's actually deeper than that. When I went back to school for landscape architecture only eight years ago at Berkeley, in my year, there was only one Afri I had one African-American classmate. And I was one of two students who had grown up in an urban environment. Today, when I work on a big public project, the design team could be 20, 30, 40 people from a dozen firms and city agencies. And maybe there's a couple of other Asian-Americans on that design team. But often, I'm the only person of color and I'm always the only queer person. And this is not just a call out to the young people, but to the adults, the faculty members, the parents, the alumni. Um, architecture, landscape architecture, and planning have some of the lowest second career rates of any professions. And I, I know every day, I use my previous experience uh, leading not-for-profit organizations and it makes me a better designer. It makes me better able to work with communities and with everyone sitting at the table. So one of the things is I really believe that if we think that public space is so important, then we need, more we need a more diverse profession and that will create better public space for everyone that creates a better society for everyone. So I ask that you think about public space. You think about the role it plays in your lives, the role it plays in the lives of your families, and the role it plays in our society. And to become involved, and to consider it as a profession, and join me in helping to design the society in which we wish to live. Thank you.